Hi, everybody, and thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy to, to be here. And I'm going to talk in the next uh, 24, 25 minutes about the security of machine learning, a topic uh, which, which I've been researching on for 10 years, more or less. So I'll try to squeeze everything in a very compact presentation. <laughs> And um, let me start by saying that uh, we all know and agree that AI um, is a very interesting technology. And it has been defined as the new electricity by Andrew Ng, who is one of the uh, most renowned professors in machine learning. And in fact, uh, we have recorded unprecedented success in many different applications, for example, cybersecurity, robotics, healthcare. In all these areas, uh, machine learning is used to make um, a, let's say, um, interesting impact, I would say. And uh, in fact, we have cars um, that are able to see the world around them. They are able to recognize other cars, pedestrians, traffic signs, all these sort of things. We can now uh, talk uh, with our preferred devices, including our mobile phones. And all these things are empowered by uh, machine learning, deep neural nets, and all this sort of technology. So the point of the, of the conference is whether these techniques are safe enough, despite having recorded this success and the very high accuracies. And to make a long story short, the answer is clearly no. And we already seen some examples in previous talks. For example, uh, Sadia showed this example, uh, devised by researchers from UC Berkeley, uh, where you can attach, essentially, um, stickers onto stop signs to have them misclassified as uh, speed limit signs. And in the video, you see on the left, the car is approaching the modified stop sign, which is misclassified as a speed limit for most of the frames. Whereas on the right hand side, you see that uh, the stop is correctly um, recognized by the car. We have examples, again, um, we have seen that if you build these fancy glass frames, and this is Lujo, Lujo Bauer, and if you wear them, then the algorithm thinks you are Mila Jovovich. And this is not specific to the uh, face that is wearing the glasses, but it's a property of the glasses itself. So even if you wear these glasses, you can mislead the classifier. I have another example outside of the image domain uh, based on the um, tech, uh, audio to transcription problem. So here, uh, Nicholas Carlini and uh, David Wagner have shown that you can actually trick um, audio classifier, where the, whose goal is to transcribe the text uh, from the audio. So in this case, the attack is targeting Mozilla Deep Speech, and I'm now playing uh, the sound, the clear sound, and you will see how it is transcribed by the algorithm. Without the data set, the article is useless. So I hope you all agree that we heard this sentence. And now what I'll play is a slightly modified version of the same audio, where we can still perceive the same sentence, but you will see how it is transcribed by the algorithm. Without the data set, the article is useless. So if you pay a little bit of attention, you notice that there is a small background noise. But this is enough to trick the algorithm into thinking that the sentence is, OK, Google, browse to evil.com. OK, so, and this is completely in the hands of the attacker. Um, there are some constraints on the length of the sequence, but essentially you can trick the algorithm as you like. So all these attacks, uh, which are known as adversarial examples or evasion attacks, are based on a simple trick against the learning algorithm. And I'll try to explain uh, how they work, essentially, in the next slides. So as most of you know, may know, uh, the, mod the modern success of AI is based on uh, the power of numerical optimization and the availability of big label data sets. So what you typically have is a collection, for example, of images or of data in general with labels. And now you can feed this data onto a big deep net to make predictions on the data. And uh, you, you train the networks or the classifiers in general by minimizing a function which measures the error made on these data points. And this is called the loss function. It's L in the slides. So you optimize this function. You try to minimize the, the error of the predictions you make on the training points by adjusting the parameters of the deep net, so the, the vector of weights w. How do you do that? You do that by essentially gradient descent. So you compute the derivative of the function and you use it to update the weights. And this will iteratively reduce the error uh, 
uh, during the training process. Okay? Now, uh, the idea behind adversarial attacks is exactly to exploit the same mechanism to trick the classifier. So this is something um, um, you can do by essentially maximizing, trying to maximize the loss with respect to manipulations to the data points instead of adjusting the network parameters. And this is an idea uh, we explored in the 2012 and 2013 in these papers, and it has been then popularized by the famous work by Google Brain, where they shown essentially the same vulnerability on deep learning algorithms. So how it works is basically um, by again exploiting the derivative of the output of the classifier. So here you have this loss function, you can imagine it's something that if I maximize it, the probability of parrot will become probability of bookcase or of any other class. So that's what the function measures. Now what you do is you compute the derivative of this function, and this will tell you how to shape the noise to trick the classifier. So you add this noise to the input image, and what you have is that now uh, the image is only slightly manipulated, but it's misclassified as bookcase. OK, so that's the intuition behind it. From a more formal perspective, you can imagine in a simplified problem that you only have two classes. Malicious points are the red ones, and legitimate points are the blue ones. And what you want to do here is to minimize this score, which, means, uh, which measures maliciousness of uh, the, class, the, the predictions. Right? So the highest G is, the, the higher it is, the higher the probability of malware, for example. So what the attacker wants to do is to minimize this score by manipulating the input sample x. And what you have typically is a set of constraints um, with, that define a feasible domain of transformations. In the easiest case, you have LP distances. But in many cases, those constraints are application specific. So it depends really on the kind of features that, you are, that you're looking at. And, um, this is the main idea, so formalize these attacks as optimization problems. And now that uh, after you do that, you can essentially uh, leverage all the tools for, from optimization to solve the problem. And in the easiest way, since for most of the classifiers, this is a differentiable function, then you can use projected gradient descent, which in this simple case would craft something like that. So you follow the gradient of the, of the function that you have in the background, and when you hit the constraint, you project to stay within the feasible domain. So that was the main idea. And of course, you can attack many classifiers because they are differentiable, because you need this property to train them. So in this case, you can trick support vector machines, neural nets. At that time, when we explored this idea, uh, there was no uh, deep learning framework available. So we didn't have the possibility to compute the gradient automatically, so we had to do the job, the art job by hand, and compute the gradients. So that's just an example of how you can craft noise against these classifiers. And so that's why they, they taught us how to derive function at school, to break <laughs> class machine learning when we grow up, right? <laughs> and uh, we did some experiments, of course, on the digits, on the um, unwritten digit images, and this is uh, one of the examples that we get. In this case, the goal was to classify trees against sevens, so just two classes, and we found that by just changing few pixels in the image uh, was enough to fool cl the classifier. Now, the important thing to note here is that uh, typically what you expect to find is that the perturbation tends to change the tree into a seven, because you tend to believe that you need to mimic the other class to break, to evade detection. But instead, surprisingly, um, these classifiers are significantly vulnerable because you just need to create a sample which is slightly farther away from the known, uh, the known uh, training instances for this class. So that's, the, that's one of the key observations in this case. And we did some other experiments on a more interesting uh, problem, for example, we did an analysis on uh, a recent classifier, which is called Malconf, which aims to classify um, executable files um, for Windows and determine whether they are malicious or not. And they do that by learning a deep net from the raw bytes. So we thought that was a, a bad idea. <laughs> and we, we talked with the authors. And then we got this challenge on, on trying to break it. And we did it by running the attack against this classifier. And what we found is that you can essentially craft a few uh, 
padding bytes that you can add at the end of the file to actually evade the static analysis uh, based detector. So in this case, by just adding uh, 10 kilobytes, you can evade the classifier with 60% probability. And again, in this case, uh, the bytes that we append to the file are optimized by, using the, by looking at the gradient of the neural net in this case. And again, uh, this is again uh, a case where you can say that to evade detection, you just need to create a sample which is slightly different from the malicious known examples that you add. So this is true in many applications if you don't um, design your algorithm in a, in a robust way. So that's the vulnerability of learning algorithms. Now, as Nicholas pointed out before, uh, those attacks are white box because you need the gradient information to craft the noise on the input samples. And uh, what you can actually do to run them in a black box attack, in a, bl a black box case, is to approximate um, the target classifier. So in that case, the attacker is only required to be able to collect some data, ideally sample from the same distribution of the training data of the target classifier. And then if the system, if the target system is available as a service online, for example, you can query it, and then you can use the labels to um, relabel your training points, and then eventually you can learn a copy of the target. So that's uh, the surrogate model that the attacker can build. And now if you run the attacks against your local copy of the model, then you can see if they transfer to the target model. Okay? And that's called the transferability property of attacks. And um, this is also uh, what Nicholas investigated in the more recent papers. And uh, uh, we had a um, recent result at in this year where we ran an analysis to try to understand when attacks crafted against a given family of learning algorithms transfers to another family and when it doesn't hold. So it's not true that it transfers uh, anyway in all cases. So um, this is something to keep in mind. On that, um, we did again experiments, this time on another case study on uh, Android malware. And we tested this detector, uh, which is called Drebin. Drebin again runs a static analysis on the APK files for Android and it looks for specific features that you can extract from uh, static analysis. So for example, it checks if a given application is sending messages or if it's using some specific API calls, things like that. On top of this representation, it learns a classifier to separate benign uh, from malware samples. So what it did in this case was uh, crafting an attack, again using this idea of uh, crafting the noise following the gradient of the classifier, and what we found is that uh, we can actually evade the classifier. So here you have detection rate at 1% at false alarms by adding content to the APK file, so to the application. Something like uh, fake permissions or connections to websites which will never be uh, actually executed. So all of these transformations are preserving the functionality of the malware. But you see here that if you just inject 5 to 15 such features into each malware application. In the white box case, you can basically drive the detection rate to zero very quickly. And even in the black box case, where you build an approximation of the real detector, you can uh, evade that by in slightly increasing the attack effort, so injecting or manipulating more objects within the file. Okay, so that's. Um, an interesting result, which again shows that these techniques can be vulnerable in different domains where, they, where they've been applied. Regarding defenses, I don't have much time to cover all the thousands of papers that appeared in recent years, but I can categorize them into two main families, at least the defenses that work to some extent, because there were many published defenses that turned out not to be really effective. For those that work, we can see we have two main complementary approaches. One is based on the idea of robust optimization, which basically simulates the game between the classifier and the attacker, and you try to learn a classifier, retrain the classifier on, on simulated attacks. So this is also known as adversarial, train, uh, adversarial training. But interestingly, in some cases, 
it's equivalent to using a specific regularizer. So you don't even need to generate the samples. You can uh, define a regularizer for your loss function, and that's, uh, that will be the best, the optimal regularizer against the specific noise that you assume from the attacker. That's for the first line of defense, and the second, one of line, the second line of successful defenses is based on, on the idea of rejecting or explicitly detecting the attacks. So, all in all, it means that we give the classifier the possibility to say, I don't know, or we have an additional class where the classifier can put the attacks in or samples that cannot cl be classified reliably. So that's the other uh, underlying idea. Again, here I can show you an example of uh, the first kind of defense, where we again take the uh, Android malware case, and we try to develop a robust system against uh, attacks that we crafted. And here, so what we did is to uh, understand which was the optimal regularizer for that classifier, which turns out to be this formulation. I'm not, not going to give the details, but um, the intuition is that we just change the function optimized by the classifier during training to, to take into account that uh, there are attacks. And what we get now is these um, red lines here, which show that the classifier that we trained is much more robust than the first version that we have, which is the green line. The blue one, just for reference, is a combination of classifiers, because typically we believe that uh, training different systems and then averaging improves the robustness to attacks, which is true to some extent, but it's far from the optimal conditions. Okay, so now to break the robust system that we trained, you need to change more than 100 features. And, uh, this comes with some theoretical guarantees, but of course the intuition is that what happens now is that the classifier is no longer giving high importance, high weights to few specific features. What it does is to distribute the weights uh, across all features in an evener way. So every feature now has a maximum bounded absolute weight, so basically to have a drop in the score of the classifier, a significant drop in the score of the classifier, you need to change much more features, because by changing one, you just have a small impact. So that's the idea. We de-emphasize uh, the importance of features during the learning process. So that's for the evasion part. Unfortunately, that's only a tiny, uh, uh, a simple scenario a single scenario where you can uh, attack learning algorithms. There are uh, many other attacks that you can stage against learning algorithms, and we categor categorize all of them in this uh, recent paper. So we've talked about evasion attacks, but there are other possibilities. For example, if the attacker can uh, tamper with the training process, what he can do is inject implant backdoors that will allow for specific misclassification at test time. We, we, we have discussed before uh, privacy attacks in which you try to understand whether a sample was part of the training set, or you can even reconstruct information about the model or about some training sample itself by querying the classifier. And uh, so these are all other avenues of attacks. And what I'm going to discuss in the next slide is this idea of poisoning. So where essentially, just to give you another example, so essentially the idea here is that you have an attacker that can manipulate the training points. You, you, he, can, he has the possibility of injecting new uh, points into the training set. And uh, the purpose is to try to maximize the error at test time on clean data to effectively carry out a um, denial of service attack. Okay, so I want to cause misclassifications for legitimate users. That's the goal. This can be um, formalized again as an optimization problem. It's much more complex than the evasion one, because now you have to account for the fact that the classifier changes while you change the attack points, because the attack points are now part, are train, are the training points. And so, in fact, this can be formulated as a bi-level optimization problem. You want to maximize the error on some clean points, subject to the fact that you retrain the classifier on the poisoning points. Okay. Now, besides the mathematical complexity of the approach, the good news from, from the attacker perspective is that you can again solve this by gradient-based optimization. So you can compute the gradient of this problem by basically applying a trick 
you can get rid of this inner optimization, which is the learning problem, and you can put the equilibrium conditions there, which is just a linear system. Now, by inverting them, you can compute the gradient, and again, you can stage training time attacks by gradient-based optimization against learning algorithms. We tested that on these, uh, again, super vector machines in this 2012 paper, and uh, what we found in this simple case uh, was very interesting. So, namely, we tried, we considered the problem of separating fours and zeros, and we learned an SVM on 100 digits to do that. Then um, we considered uh, the same digit, so this is a training digit. At the first iteration, we just changed the label in the training set. So assume that you have this four, which is mislabeled as a zero. And if you look at the error on the clean test samples, now it just increases by less than 1%. Okay, so this is just if you flip the label of this point. But what happens if you optimize the noise on this training point, is that, and then you inject this point with the label zero in your training set, is that all the learning process is essentially screwed up. So if you just show this example to the learning algorithm, you get a test error larger than 20%. So that was quite interesting, because by controlling less than 1% of the training points, the attacker is able to push the error, the test error, up to 20%. Okay, so that, that was surprisingly vulnerable to these sort of attacks. There are, of course, um, defenses against poisoning that you can use, and they are based on the idea of uh, essentially detecting outliers into the training set. Because for a poisoning point to be effective, it has to be substantially different from the rest of the training set. So you can leverage this idea to um, detect these attacks. Okay, I have not, not much time to go into these details, but that's the general idea. And typically, defenses against uh, poisoning attacks are much, are much more effective than uh, defenses against evasion attacks. If you're interested, we also had a recent paper on that last year. And um, all of this uh, sort of discussion is sum summarized in this paper, which I described before, which I mm, already pointed out. So if you're interested, please refer to this one. And we also released all the implementation of the attacks that I just described, including some defenses, as an open source library, which is called SACML. OK, now I just want to conclude by trying to uh, sum up and saying why, is it, why AI is vulnerable, why it's so vulnerable to these attacks. And I, I'll rephrase uh, something uh, stated by Bernard Sholkov. So, um, First of all, we have always to keep in mind that the underlying idea be, um, under which machine learning algorithms are designed is that the data that you use for training is representative of data that you're going to classify at test time. And this is called the IID assumption. So in some sense, you have to classify things which are similar to the training points that you have. And now, the success of AI, and deep learning in particular, happened on tasks for which we were able to collect a lot of labeled data. You can think to image classifiers and ImageNet. We have millions of examples, labeled data, and so on. That task specifically, we, are, we were able to achieve surprising accuracy. But of course, we cannot build such models for every kind of task that you are going to encounter in the real world. Like, like if you have a self-driving car and you put it on the street, you're going to encounter situations which were not uh, envisioned during training. So, and the interesting thing is that adversarial attacks point exactly at this lack of robustness which comes from IAD spe specialization. So it's just an instance of this more general problem that we need test data to be representative of the training ones. Okay, so that's my pick on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Batista. It's question time. Your Slido. <clears throat> I have a question, actually. Uh, if today there are already factories which use uh, visual anomaly detection based on these advanced technologies, who, is, who should be responsible for the solution so that they are not attacked or hacked this way? Is it the vendor of the camera? Well, uh, this is, yeah, yeah. This is something which is being discussed uh, at the different levels, so not at the technical level, 
but from the ethics perspective and then from the law perspective, and it's uh, debatable. So there's no clear answer to that, I, I guess. And should they know yeah. that their solution they have purchased uses AI and ML? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I think so, yeah. Um, the thing is that up to now, we're not seeing like uh, this problem in practice just because we don't have completely automated self-driving cars on the streets, for example. So uh, there's no yet the problem of facing the responsibilities of accidents and so on and other things. Um, but definitely it's something that has to be discussed in the coming years. But I think we will go we're going to see this problem much, much later in time. So we, we still have a, lo a lot of time to think about that. And here's actually a question whether these uh, adversarial attacks were observed in the real world already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this has also been discussed um, previously. Yeah. So I guess for the case of malware, we have some evidence. It's not clear whether they are attacking the AI component or just, you know, the old pipeline or these kind of things. But um, one thing um, that I believe is that we're going to see more and more of these attacks in the next years because, you know, Whereas on the one hand, it's difficult to craft them because you have, have to know about machine learning, optimization, and all these kind of things. On the other hand, we are somehow weaponizing the attacks by just uh, making them available also as source code, open source code, and this kind of thing. So once the gun is built, someone else will, will use it to shoot. So that's the, the point. So I, I, my, my point is I believe we will have uh, increasing evidence of such attacks in many different applications in the future. And do you see a business opportunity? Because there are today companies which make enough money doing the penetration testing, so something similar yeah. for machine learning. We're, we're actually planning, uh, so we do this activity in one of the European projects that we have. We do a sort of security testing of uh, ML-based um, software. And then so, yes, I think you can automatize that to some extent, but then, of course, it depends on the representations that you use, so the features that you have. That part is clearly application-specific. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. And one more. Uh, if a machine learning model is sensitive to noise, does this only mean that the model failed to capture the principal feature of a sample? It could be. I mean, uh, those models are just trained to minimize the loss function. So what they, and they are lazy. So they will just pick the easiest correlation that they find in data to solve the problem. So um, that, that, that's why they are so vulnerable, because there is a lot of uh, spurious correlations, especially in high-dimensional data. And they are exactly leveraging this thing to, to make the detection, to make predictions. And the last one, don't you think that uh Doing this <laughs> research motivates potential attackers to do the adversarial. Oh, uh, <laughs> I think uh, what we're trying to do is staying one step ahead of the attacker by trying to make attacks which are very sophisticated and then asking ourselves if, if we can find a countermeasure. So it's not just uh, to have fun in breaking uh, machine learning algorithms, it's just to, say, to see if we're able to. Uh, build more robust and reliable AI in the future. Batista, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much.